Now this morning, we're going to be talking about the righteous for the unrighteous. If you have your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 3, be finding that great section of Scripture. The righteous for the unrighteous. We're going to prepare our hearts and our minds to jump right into 1 Peter chapter 3. But I want to share to you about a, a story about sacrifice with all of you. The story's told about two brothers who were playing. They were young. They were playing in a sandbar by a riverbank years ago. One ran and after the other up to a large sand pile that was there. And unfortunately, the mound was not solid. And their weight caused them to sink into the sand there at the edge of the bank. With the water flowing and everything like that, it was, it was, it was like quicksand. When the boys didn't return for several hours when they were supposed to have been home, they organized a search for them. And, 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 and they went out searching for them. They found the younger brother, though, later. And, and, and he, he was from here up, sticking out of the sand. And he was unconscious. They dug him out to his waist, and he finally gained consciousness. When he woke up, the searchers asked, Where's your brother? He said, I am standing on his shoulders with a sacrifice of his own life, the older brother lifted the younger to safety. Now that tangible and sacrificial love of others, a, a brother literally served as a foundation for the younger brother's life. That's how he lived his life from that point on. He said, I want to live a life worthy of my brother's sacrifice. Well, this story kind of gives us a starting place today. A place from which we can begin to understand what, what true sacrifice looks like. What sacrifice looks like and what it means to stand on the shoulders of our Savior. Again, if you have your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 22. Here's what he says. For Christ also suffered once for our sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. Why? To bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism and that, that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and into the right hand, God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and power in submission to Him. This passage highlights many amazing truths about our faith, about Christ, and about our response to His Spirit. His sacrifice. 1 Peter 3, again, 18, again, says this. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Let's think about that. The sacrifice of Christ. Our passage begins with the recognition of the unparalleled sacrifice that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ made. The Apostle Paul declared in 1 Peter chapter 3, 18, the English Standard Version, for Christ suffered the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. Here we witness the enormity of Christ's selfless act on the cross where he took his, himself and he took upon himself the full weight of our sin and death. 2 Corinthians talks about he became sin for us that, that we might obtain his righteousness. We got his righteousness. He got our sin. Here's a witness of that, that sacrifice. The, the gospel of Mark captures that moment. He tells us in Mark chapter 15, 37 to 39, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. As the righteous one, he took upon himself the sins of the unrighteous, bridging the gap 
that sin had created between humanity and God. We had been separated. The Bible talks about that. The Bible says, you know, sin separates us from God. He paid a debt that we could not pay so that we might experience the righteousness of heaven. Again, it says he was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit. So let's look at the, the purpose of Christ's sacrifice. As we continue in our passage, let's focus on the purpose behind Jesus' sacrifice. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And later, part of verse 18 reveals the purpose of that stating. He says, he did that that he might bring us to God. That was why he did it. That was the purpose behind it. The ultimate goal of Christ's sacrifice was not merely to absolve us of sin, but also not only to, to remove those sins and take them away, but to bring us to God, bring us back. You see, sin separated us, to reconcile us to the source of eternal life and perfect love. I love how Peter says that Christ brings us to God. The implication being that we're far off, that we're separated from, that we are apart from God. You might be sitting here this morning thinking that very thing. You know, that's kind of how I feel. I, I feel kind of a, a long way away from God. I, I, I feel separated from God. You might be thinking, you know, I feel far off, separated from, and apart from God. Well, if that's you, there's good news for you. If that's you, there's, there's great news for you. Christ died once for all so that he might be able to to bring you close. Isn't that fantastic? So he could bring us close. Ephesians 3.12 says, In him and through faith in him, we might approach God with freedom and confidence. In Romans chapter 5, 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we boast in hope of the glory of God. You see, it's through Him that we get this access to God, that we get to come to God, that we get to get in His presence. We are made righteous through Christ. We stand on His shoulders, breathing the sweet air of eternal salvation and unfailing love. This is our boast and claim. We live because He gave His life for us. We are brought near to God, reconciled, because Christ went to the very depth of sin and death on our behalf. In fact, our passage even shows how Christ went to those, he says, what did he say, imprisoned spirits of old to proclaim in 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20. And being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, we're saved through water. Christ is Lord over the living and the dead. Have you ever thought about that? His blood flew backwards. It flew right then at that place. And it, flew, blew, it, it flowed forward into us. That's, that's amazing when you think about that. Christ is Lord. He brought us near to God. He tells us where we are. He is Lord over the living and the dead. And he is at God's, what the Bible says, at his right hand. With angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And what is our response to the otherworldly love and sacrifice? The response is of repentance and faith. 1 Peter chapter 3, 21. Peter emphasizes the importance of our response to Christ's sacrifice. In, in verse 21 it states this. It's, it says... Baptism, which corresponds to this. Now, you remember he talked about how the, that those, those that were saved in the ark by water and all this. He says it corresponds to that. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our repentance and our faith is a way to find expression in the act of baptism. 
symbolizing the cleansing of our sins. It is an appeal to God for a transformation and a purification of our hearts. The book, The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren says this about baptism. Through fa baptism, we proclaim our faith and publicly acknowledge our dedication to following Jesus. You see, he's saying here, baptism is, is, is not, there's nothing magical about the water, but he says it is our declaration and our demonstration of our faith in what God has done for us. That Jesus died, that he was buried in resurrection. It is a declaration and a demonstration of our faith that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. Not only do we, do we believe in that death, burial, and resurrection, but we participate in that death, burial, and resurrection. We are dead in our sins. We are buried with Christ. We raise again to walk in newness of life. Again, nothing magical about the water. So many people in the denomination will say, you know, Church of Christ believe y'all just think there's something magical in the water. No, there's magical in your faith. James says faith without works is dead. If it doesn't act, it means nothing. And I am dead in my sins. I am buried with Christ and I raise again to walk in newness of life. That's how it is. Baptism is that. Our declaration, demonstration of faith. Along with baptism, we respond to Christ through faith. Believing what he taught and living as he instructed us. We declare it and we demonstrate it when we're baptized. But then we live out our faith. You see, some people think that, you know, that's somehow where it ends. It is just a one-time act, and that's all there is to faith. That it's kind of like getting on an elevator. You press the button, go on up. No, that's not how it works. You know, I've used this illustration before, but it's a great illustration. Faith is like, you know, following God, having faith in God is like flying in a plane. You stop, you drop. You know, you know, it's not like getting on an elevator and pushing the button and going up. You stop, you drop. You keep going forward in your faith. And he tells us some things we need to do. And to, not only do we act out our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection by being baptized into Jesus Christ, but we continue to act out that faith in what God has told us to do by the things that we do. We don't do what we do because, because we're afraid of anything. We don't do what we do because there's this great commandment that we don't do what we do because we're checking off some list. We do what we do because we have a great faith in what God has done. And we want to demonstrate who Jesus is to the world around us. And so there's many things you can come up with, and i got a few things that I want to put up here this morning that we're going to do to demonstrate our faith. Not only we start that demonstration by our demonstration and declaration by being baptized. He tells us there in 1 Peter, but we continue that thought in our lives. First of all, we do it by loving God and loving others. We talked about that last week. The greatest commandment, what is it? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and you know, everything about you, and then love your neighbors yourself. We talked about that. Jesus emphasized the importance of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we said last week, loving your neighbors yourself. This command encapsulates what we said last week was the essence of Christianity, the essence of living for God. And found in multitude passages like we looked at last week in, in Mark chapter 12, 30 and 31, and, and Matthew chapter 22, 37 through 39. But not only do we do that, we, we also follow his teachings. Jesus instructs his disciples to follow his teachings closely. In the Gospel of John, he says it this way. If you love me, you will keep my commands. This includes living according to the principles that he gave us. Uh, one example, now I could give you many examples, but one example is just take the, the Sermon on the Mount. What a great sermon on principle living that he's given us there on things that we need to do about trusting God and having and, and how to treat people and, and forgiveness and all these different things that he gives us in that great sermon on the mountain in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 then you need to not only do that you need to humbly be humble and serve others Jesus demonstrated the importance of humility and service through his own life and teachings as a matter of fact he, he kind of got towards the end there what did he do Remember the story in the Bible in, in John chapter 13, 1 through 17? He washed his disciples' feet as an example of humble service. How many of you watched the, uh, the football game last week? I believe that's going to go down as probably one of the all-time best football games that I've ever seen. It was really good. But, of course, you know, you don't just go to the, watch that football game for the football game. 
you watch it for the commercials too sometimes, you know. They had some pretty good commercials on there. But there was one that really caught my attention. It's, it's actually, a, 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 there's kind of been a thing on Facebook blowing up about that commercial, about this thing. And, 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 and it was, it was, I thought it was great. But there's some that say, oh, no, that wasn't so good because, you know, Jesus only washed the disciples' feet. He wasn't talking about washing everybody's feet. I don't believe that. Matter of fact, he says, this is a, an example that I've given you that you need to go out and show what service is. Here's a commercial. I'll just show it. Don't ask me what you know is true. Don't have to tell you. some of the conservative end of, oh, no, that's, that's not what you... Yes, he did. And yes, we should. You know, I, I looked at some of those scenes in there and I thought to myself, but you know, what an impact we'd do if we, if we treated people like that. They're, right now, we are such a divided people. How great it would be. I love the, the abortion clinic picture there, for instance, of of the little pregnant girl and her and that girl that's anti-abortion, what was she doing? Washing that little girl's feet, not screaming at that little girl. And all those scenes, the the the, the policeman and the other. By the way, uh, you know, one of the things that really touched me at the funeral the other day was all those police officers there. I bet you half your department was there. Seemed like, uh, well, how what an impact. Uh, they didn't have to be there. But, Matter of fact, you, the sheriff didn't tell him, you got to be there. Matter of fact, he told me, he said, can you believe this? Those guys did this. They weren't told they had to. I mean, how are we going to make an impact if we don't serve the people that we live with? Sharing the good news of Jesus is great, but we share it through starting with the love that we have for others and the love that we share and the humility that we share and the kindness that we share with other people. And, and Jesus instructs his followers to follow the example that I have set for you. Now, there are churches that take it and say, oh, you mean we're going to have a foot washing Sunday here at Lion Air Church of Christ? We could. Maybe. No, we're not. Uh, but, no, I think you need to take it outside. Take it to the people with really dirty feet. And let's do them. Of course, some of you could probably use a little foot washing this morning. But what I'm saying is we need to learn to serve like Jesus served. And then we need, and, and after we've done that, then we can do the next thing, share the gospel. Jesus commissioned his disciples. This was after he had washed their feet, by the way. He says, he, he commissioned his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've taught you. Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. So this idea, now there are groups that out there say, well, really all you got to do is just serve people. No, you got to serve them, but then you got to talk to them. Service is not enough, but service is going to open the door. And they're not going to know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care kind of thing. They're not going to do what they, they're not going to respond until, first of all, they know what, why you're telling me this is because you, you really care about me and you want to do these things. That's one of the reasons that we do our, our groups that we meet on Sunday nights is to try to break those doors down to let people know, hey, listen, we care about you personally and individually as an individual. But not only that, when we go out into the world and we do those things, sharing the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ is the central aspect of Christian faith. And you you not only have to show up, but, you, and, but you've got to act up, and then you've got to speak up. And then finally, you've got to trust God's provisions. Jesus repeatedly taught his followers to trust in God's provisions and not worry about everything else. 
We talked about that a few weeks ago. You know, what did we say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. And I had the little, remember I had the rice up there. The, those are the little things. If you put the things first, the big things don't fit. You get everything out of order, first things first. And he says, listen, don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of it. By the way, finance committee, I know we didn't plan next week. God will take care of that <laughs> It's because it's going to be an expense. Uh, but God's going to take care of that. Don't worry about it. He told us to trust in his provisions. By the way, when I think about this church, I think about that often. Uh, we've had this discussion in our elders meeting multiple times that we, we get to talking about things. And the elders very, by the way, I'll just tell you this, they hardly ever, ever, and this is no exaggeration at all, talk about money in our elders meetings. That's, they, they leave that to the finance committee mostly. The finance committee says, we think you ought to do that. They'll look at that. They say, well, do we have the money? Okay, yeah, we're going to do that. Uh, and it really hadn't changed much, to be honest. When, when we didn't have finance committee, I remember years ago, Terry, when we would have elders meetings, the elders, somebody would come in. They say, can we do this? And they say, well, uh, is it right? Should we be doing it? Do we have the money? Well, yes. Well, why are you asking us? Go do it. And, and, and that's pretty well what the elders do a lot of things, but, but we do have a little more controls over things a little bit more now. But, but the elders sat there, but we were talking about some of the things, and, and, the, and, and it was unanimous. The elders spoke up. It's almost like in harmony. They said, you know, God has always provided everything we've needed for this church. Everything. Whenever we've needed it, it's come through. Even when we didn't know we needed it, it's come through. Uh you know, I, I'm excited about this benevolence thing that we have gotten. Uh, who, who would have thought? But you know what? It's coming at a great time because we've had some needs. God's, we need to understand and we need to trust in God's providence. He will provide. He's given us these. So don't worry about the material needs. In the Sermon on the Mount, he instructs them to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What? Again, all these things, these little things you were worried about, I'll take care of it. These instructions, along with a lot of others, I'm just giving you a few, build a framework of how we're called to live out our faith in response to the teachings of Jesus' examples. He gave his life, the righteous for the unrighteous. That's what he did. That's, that's how he, he, he told us that we're supposed to go. He gave his life, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that we might experience abundant life, so that he could, what did he say? Bring us to God. He is the final word in the world filled with incessant talking and boasting and bragging about their own greatness. Peter was a devout follower of and an eyewitness of the humanity and the majesty of Jesus. And I trust that his perspective on the understanding of Jesus is an important one. But not only an important one, I believe it's a correct one. If you feel far away from God today, it is Jesus who brings you close. If you feel like your life is closing in around you, suffocating you, remember to stand on the shoulders of Christ. Live a life of repentance and faith as you follow in the footsteps of Jesus. As Peter says in chapter 4. Above all love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one, or hospitality to one another without grumbling. Ooh, that's a hard one. Sometimes we like to do things. But we like to do. You know, we're, we're more. You know, uh, we, we, we'll do it. But we'll grumble about it. But he says do it without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful servants of God's grace in various forms. Man, what kind of church would we have if that happened? What would we do if that happened? If we, if we loved each other when we failed, he says it covers a multitude of sins. If we offer hospitality, hospitality with each other, by the way, next week after services, I, I, I can't remember if I mentioned that or not, but after services next Sunday, we're also, this is a Youth Emphasis Sunday, we're going to feed 
the teens and the, uh, the, the, the aimers that are coming through, they're on their way. They got another nine-hour drive from here, but they said, you know what, we want to come and, and see you guys. And uh, uh, so they're going to come and stop and, and do their thing, and we're going to feed them afterwards. And uh, uh, so we're going to show a little hospitality. I, I love Conrad. You know, I called him yesterday. I thought, man, I'm going to call Conrad this, and I don't know what we're going to do. And, and uh, these guys are coming, and we, we really we can't send them on the road and not feed them. And I uh, called him up. He said, no problem. I got this covered. That's Conrad all the time. That is just Conrad. He, that's his spirit. That's his attitude. This is no big deal. hundred people, pff, I'll cook that. <laughs> you know? I mean, there will be a lot of people that I know if you'd said they'd do that. Say, yeah, but why'd you do that? Why didn't you give us another week or two to get that ready? And man, you know how much that's going to cost if we do that? And not Conrad. <laughs> Offer hospitality to, to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Wow. That is bottom line Christianity. If we just did these things and kept our eyes on Jesus, how different our community would be. Bow with me. Father, we just praise your name. Father, we love you. We thank you for you coming, the righteous, to give yourself for us, the unrighteous. And Father, help us to live out our faiths through your example, to be more like you. Help us to serve. Help us to be the people that you would have us to do, to trust in your providence. Father, to, to do the things that you've asked us to do, to share your good news, to be humble in our service, to follow your teachers' teachings and to love each other. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. You may be here this morning. I mentioned again in that same section of scriptures, he mentions the idea that baptism is important in that it is the first step towards your life uh, uh, of obedience to God. It shows your, it's a declaration and demonstration of your faith in Jesus by de declaring and demonstrating, I am dead, I'm buried, I'm raised again. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again. That is the gospel, the good news. You could participate in that this morning. The baptismal uh, pool is ready. We're ready for you. But it, then you go from there and you serve and you minister and do all these things that we talked about this morning. But if we could help you do that, I want to encourage you as we stand and we offer the invitation.